Hey, what's up? It's your girl, Atangela, the voice inside your speaker box. And today on the virtual field trip, I am super excited to have some of the best of the best in the game on the hot line, the tan line in the hot seat, bringing it to you with Baton Rouge's official number one for hip hop and R&B. Now, you know, with TV One, they've been a trusted source for entertainment for years, right? Well, they're not going to disappoint us because now it's almost that time for them to present season three of ATL Homicide. And, you know, today I want to talk about it with Dave. Even Quinn and on the show, Angelo Diaz is on the flashbacks, correct? And then we have Vince Velasquez with Christopher Diaz on the flashbacks, but I got the real deal in the hot seat. How are you? What's happening? Glad to be on the tan line. Good afternoon. <laughs> Now look, I know that you all have been super busy and you've got to be excited about season three, getting ready to hit the big screen, but I got questions that need answers. Just watching the show and being so fascinated with the work that you all put in to make a major impact. How did you know that this was the line of work for you, that this was the calling for your life? That's a great question. First of all, I want to tell you, I want a crystal ball like you have behind Listen, you. if it doesn't make you disco ball happy, don't show that. up. I love it. You just gave me an idea. I love that. So Tangie, the, the question is how did we know, how did I know this was for me? Uh, David and I have two different, our story started in two different directions, but it ended up meeting in the middle. Um, I was an aircraft engineer. I was in the military fixing fighter jets, uh, top gun. I thought I was, you know, going to be, I was living overseas, right. England, Germany. I was living the life, but you know, you don't really know what happiness is until you really experience it. And you can imagine what it would be like. It's easy to look back at it and go, man, that was a great move. I got out of the military, became a civilian, um, fixing airplanes for a major airline in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. That's what took me to Atlanta. But I get, I kept get pulling, getting pulled into the direction of law enforcement. And uh, I followed my big jump. big jump, big jump, big jump, and, and big jump and a big pay jump in the other direction. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I took a 75% pay cut with a brand new kid, mind you, in 1995 to become a police officer. Uh, and in my opinion, was the best thing I ever did. Not only did I feel like I had a good career, I helped a lot of people. I think right. I served my community, but I got to meet this wonderful dude that I call my partner. Uh, right. And then we, we did the magic this ha started happening in the year 2000. And I see that it is like a family bond, you know, because he refused to do this interview without. He said, no, wait a second, we can't get started. My partner's on his way. That's now, right. <laughs> that's how we knew that you got pulled back into this life and saying, OK, well, you know what? I think this might be the way. But when you start saying a, a major pay cut, People would really say run in the opposite direction. <laughs> I was, they, people thought I was crazy. They're like, well, let me get this right. You're going to take 75% pay cut. You got a brand new son to become a cop? I said, right. yeah. Yeah, they I mean, Did you have any cops in your family? Was it something that just. No, no, I had, I had the, we had the other side of law enforcement in my family. We, we, we came from the other side of the tracks. So <laughs> okay. Quite I got the you. Opposite, quite the opposite. <laughs> now that's your story. David, how did you know that this was the life for you? You know, so in the 70s, I saw most of my cousins and relatives getting loaded into paddy wagons, and I just wanted to see what I could do. So mm -hmm. since about age five or six, I wanted to be the police. Two years after high school, in 1985, I joined the Atlanta police. Greatest decision of my life. There wasn't a day that I just didn't enjoy it, even though I saw some things yeah. that are reprehensible. I love the community. I was in projects for the first 10 years with my people. I love the corner store at the bodega, hanging out. It was different. You know, I was the neighborhood cop and I loved it. So by the time I went to homicide, it was an easy transition. I knew so many people in the street just from those alliances that I forged over the years. I met my brother from another mother, which was Vince. And we rocked and rolled that thing for the next 19 years and finished off our careers together. And you brought up a very good point. Um, a, a lot of the cops now, I see they're very detached from the community. You said that you knew the corner store, so you knew those who were raised on the block. You knew who was going to what school, who was big mama, the witch kid that was cutting up. So community policing and neighborhood policing looked a lot different then than it does now. Do you feel that that disconnect is making it a lot harder, not just for law enforcement, but for the community as a whole? You know. Fully. I mean, I, I think the policing as we know it, that neighborhood, neighborhood cop thing is, is gone. We've seen now a more tactical, a more overly paramilitary police department. You know, I was out there with a six shooter. That's what they gave me when I went out there. I had a revolver. 
And I, I you know, you I, had to, I had to use my, and, 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 and a nightstick. And I was out there at night in the dark. I had to have alliances. What police have to do right now is go back into the neighborhood and win one street at a time. You want to do this job and do it right, win the neighborhood. If you win the neighborhood, you're not going to have anybody tear nothing up. You're going to have order because they respect you because you respect them. I mean, I never left the hood. I stayed there the first decade, the first 15 years in some of the, in some of the toughest neighborhoods you would ever visit Atlanta. I mean, it was, it was, it was beautiful though. Great relationships. Well, see here in Baton Rouge, it's really tough. You know, our crime rate is crazy. It's January of 2021 and they are popping off with bullets left and right. And I feel for law enforcement. Um, and doing this, I've been broadcasting for almost 24 years and reporting the news now, it's more difficult because I either know who did it or who it happened to. But usually on both sides, I know the families that are hurting, especially if it's a child that they have to lay to rest and that homicide goes unsolved. So how important is it that you really get closure for that family? Because I'm watching the shows and, and I saw the season premiere of the 19 year old who was, I don't even want to give it away, but it touched me so much. Cause when I saw him and you were like, well, where's the body? Where's the body? And there was no body because he was trying to do something heroic as far as saving others while fleeing the scene. But it's just, it's tough. How important is it that you all get in the community and that you solve these homicides to bring some type of closure? You know, it's paramount, like to solve cases and, and to give families what they need to move on, heal, right? And, and mm -hmm. become a family again is, is what we do. That's what we work for. We don't work for the city. We don't work, even work for each other. That's, that's, those are our bosses uh, for as long as it takes to get that job done. I have a case. I have a case that... Uh, you know, I think in season one, we had some behind the scenes footage that TV One put up that I talk about a case of a young girl in 1995 that was murdered. Uh, and to this day, it still remains unsolved. I, I retired and I was not able to, to solve that case. And, and even in retirement, I still work on it. And I keep in touch with that, that young victim's mother. And so it's important because over the years, I've seen how much grief, how much strain that this mother continually goes through. Uh, and, and that's what our goal is. Our goal is to give them that closure that they can just rest easy. Uh, unfortunately, we, we don't always have that opportunity. Um, and, and you mentioned that episode um, and you're going to see that. And Dave can talk a little bit more about that. But you're going to see, you know, a father struggling even in, 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 in his moment of despair, probably knowing he's going to die, still trying to save his family. Right. That's sad. But it's that's just that, that, that's the reality of what we dealt with. And even with the type of guns that he was popped with, you're starting to see these kids younger and younger get access to those type of guns. Um, and if we were to have a roundtable discussion to say, parents, I've done this for so long, I'm now retired, um, I can give you the game. How would you explain or walk them through a situation to help keep their children away from those type of guns or those type of guns off the streets? Well, we definitely have a gun violence problem in our community. and. You know, we've got to hold the feet of law enforcement to the fire, and we got to get honest with ourselves about the proliferation of guns in our community. There's too many of them. You know, I'm not anti-gun. I just don't want guns around my children. And I would always stress, you know, you just have to police your children. You got to go back to the 60s and 70s, yeah. the way I was raised. And, you know, you got to put some fear in them. I mean, it's still not, it's not against the law. I know people <laughs> are afraid to raise their children, but... I had six of them grew up in here and you can't keep them away from what's out there. In October of 2020, my own son, who's 26, year, 26 years old, coming back from the military, was robbed and shot three times. Oh and God. I got horrible police service and everybody named mama know I'm the police. Right. <laughs> now, right. when I showed up wow. on scene, they thought I was ATL homicides here or they gonna solve it. Horrible police department gave me horrible service. And I'm working right now to bring noise to this horrible investigation for my son who was almost killed and just this close from being paralyzed. So gun violence, my son grew up in the suburbs. My one, one visit to an old friend got him fighting for his life in the hospital for weeks. So we got a problem and it affects me and, and, and we have to charge these police with serving us correctly, which is what I'm in the process of doing now because I got horrible service. 
Right. And I'm so sorry to hear that. And, you know, I know seeing it and working on it is something completely different, but that's your baby. So now that's your heart walking outside of your chest, looking at it happening and unfolding in your eyes. But this is something that you've dedicated your life to. And now knowing that horrible customer service, if you're going through a drive through is bad enough, if they forget your French fries or, or your ketchup. But when somebody's life is attached to that and you feel as if it does not matter, what type a message does that really send, you know? And I appreciate you all so much for taking us behind the scenes and showing us the importance of what goes into an investigation, um, how it's hard to do it by yourself. And it is important for the community to help. Now, you know, it's big, stitches and snitches, they go together. Mm -hmm. But if you know something, you should say something. And I'm a big advocate of that because I know that you can't do it alone. Um, how important is it that once we say something, we have the security of knowing that it will not come back in the sense of retaliation for us because that'll help us solve these crimes a lot quicker. Yeah, we, we know, we, we're down the street all the time and we would knock on doors and people would know, uh, you know, that we, they had confidence in us to, to, to protect them. There were times, you know, when, when housing projects and most of them are gone now, but when they were, when we were coming up, they were all over the place in Atlanta, as I'm sure they are in Baton Rouge back then, early 2000s, late 90s. We had witnesses who wouldn't talk. I mean, we, we, we started to think outside the box. Like, who wants to see a guy in a suit and tie knock on the door knowing you're homicide? Nobody's going to come and talk to you, right? We mailed letters. I even sent a taxi one time with my own money to pick up a witness. Mm -hmm. All they look like, anybody seeing them is somebody get into a cab, right? And they came right, down right. to the homicide office, gave us the information, and we try to protect them. Now, at the end of the day, if they want to testify, they're going to you know, have to reveal who they are. But a lot of times the information we get, we don't need them to testify. We just need that boost. We need that little bit of that push to get us in the right direction. Because the evidence is like a compass. No matter how you turn a compass, it points north. Truth is the same way. Sometimes we need a little help from the community. So we, you know, we found a way to do that to where people understood that and had confidence that we're not going to put them out there. You know, mm -hmm. they believed in us because they, again, we, we, we it wasn't Detective Quinn, Detective Velasquez, it was Vincent Quinn. That's what we went by. People knew us up by our first names. I love it. Well, Vince and Quinn, y'all are the real MVPs. And don't you dare let them tell you differently. And you already know the season premiere is January 25th. It's going to be at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm going to say 7.30 so we don't show up late. I have my popcorn. I'm going to have my Kool-Aid, the red kind, and my disco ball. Yes. I feel like I want to be one of the honorary detectives because, you know, if I see something, I'm going to say something. Uh, and, and I got you covered. And this is an open door policy. So as soon as outside reopens and you make a field trip to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know where to find us. I am grateful for the service that you all have put in. We appreciate you. And I'm super excited about season three. You hear me? Absolutely. absolutely. Love Thank it. you. Thank you we so love much. Love it. Thank you for having us. Anytime. And thank you all so much. God bless. I'll see you soon. See you soon.